Do you like blood and guts? If you don't, I apologize. If you do, you're going to like this story. We're not going to jump in. We're not going to read the text right away, but if you want to go ahead and turn to Judges 9 and find your spot, that'll be just fine. We enjoyed a great service last Sunday with Dr. Dan Boone. Wasn't it good to have him from Trebekah Nazarene University? And so we're right back into our Judges series today, starting in chapter 9. It was the most gruesome thing he had ever seen. The most haunting sounds that he had ever heard. The most traumatic experience that he had ever endured. It, there was so much blood. Blood that moments before was coursing through the veins of his brothers. Feeding them with life was now, was now streaming down a rock that would forever be stained red. As it, as it saturated the ground so much that it formed pools on top. He was the only one. They got away. Somehow in the midst of all the mayhem and the madness, he was able to escape this cruel plot and ploy by their, all of their brother, whose name was Abimelech, and he ran. He ran as fast and as hard as he could go with the sweat and the tears streaming down his face all mixing in. That, that was running down his face, and what was running through his mind were these graphic images that he saw over and over and over again and the sounds that he couldn't quite get out of his ears. He was fortunate to be alive, and he knew it. The only one who escaped. I'm describing a scene that happens in Judges 9 when one of the 70 sons, that's a lot of sons, isn't it? A lot of mamas, but there was one dad, and he's called various names, Jerob, Baal. We talked about him as Hacker a few weeks ago. You know him better as Gideon. One of Gideon's 70 sons was a, was a man named Abimelech. And Abimelech was the epitome of self-consumption and selfish ambition. When their father died, it kind of left this vacuum, a leadership void in, in Israel. And um, he saw this not as, his father's death that is, he saw it not as, not as a tragedy to grieve, but as an opportunity to grab. And he, he began to have visions of himself as the sole leader Occupying the position that his dad had, the, the lone leader, the sole survivor, the, the undisputed despot who would rule over all of Israel. But he knew that with the competition, and that's how he saw his family, not as brothers and sisters to comfort, but as competition to eliminate. That with 70 others that were surrounding this whole scenario, really there was only one way that he was going to grab that coveted place of position and power, and that was if he eliminated all the other candidates. So he came up with a plan, and he went to the lords of Shechem, very strategic because um, Gideon had some wives, but he also had some concubines, and, and Abimelech was the son not of a wife, but of, of a concubine who had come from Shechem. And so Abimelech goes to the leaders or the lords of that community, and he says, hey, we got ourselves a dilemma here. My dad's gone. There's a vacuum and a void in leadership, and so you can either have 70 people ruling over you, or you could have one. And it just so happens that my family and your family, we are the same people, and if you really only wanted one leader, and you wanted that to be me, we could probably arrange that. And so the lords of Shechem gathered and they had their little conversation and discussion amongst themselves. And where they landed was, if we're going to have a ruler over us, then it might as well be one of us. <clears throat> Let's put our lot in with Abimelech. So they, they conferred and then they preferred that he be their leader. And the first thing they did is their act with him as their, you know, their candidate was to give him a campaign contribution. And they went over to the temple called Baal Barit, and they scavenged a bunch of money, and they laid it in the lap of Abimelech, and the very first thing he did was hire a marketing crew. And their job description was very specific. It was really a role of marketing by mayhem. And their first assignment was to go out into all the different places where Gideon's other sons dwelt and to gather them all in and to bring them to a central location and to slay them on a rock which they did. It was a bloody, muddy mess as the 70 sons 
of Gideon, except for Jotham, were slain on a single rock. And it's kind of ironic. The, uh, the name of the temple, the blood, where they got their blood money to give to Abimelech was called Baal Barit. And, and it means in Hebrew, the Lord of the Covenant. And for us, you know, that it may not mean a whole lot, but for the readers in, who were the first, among the first readers, it was a sign, uh, it was a sign or a, an indication that here we are again. Once again, God's people, the Israelites, have broken covenant with the true Lord of covenant, and they have cast their allegiance and their vote for the gods of the Canaanites and their people. And covenants are kind of a tricky thing. A significant thing because you know we got to be careful who we make covenants with because whoever we make that with we get everything that, that they bring with them so you make a covenant with God you're gonna be my God I'm gonna be your people we're gonna we're gonna live life together I'm gonna obey you you're gonna empower me it's gonna be like just us right when God is our covenant partner we get everything that God brings to the table and when any other God or king or thing is our covenant partner we get whatever they bring to the table. And in this case, what Abimelech brought to the table was a big, healthy dose of death. And it's a gruesome scene in Judges 9. But at the same time, we really do know, I mean, it's a bit unusual. Seventy brothers, that's, I mean, you don't hear that very often. Talk about a TV show, that'd be the one that they would be having on now. Seventy. I mean, the, whoever those other, 17 or 18, they got nothing on this one. Seventy brothers. All slain on the same day is a pretty big deal. But at the same time, we do know that this is not the only story of a family that was slain on the stone of selfish ambition. We could call it a number of things. Greed. Greed's when you value possessions over people and no matter how much you have it's never enough and there are some people that do whatever they got to do to get more no matter who they have to do it to including their own family it could be it could be lust and God knows there have been zillions of stories since this one where the stability of a family has been slain on the stone of lust it happens every single time that a man finds a mistress or a woman finds a lover and destroys the, fam the fabric of the family all because they want what they want, when they want it, and it doesn't matter who gets hurt in the process. And what happens every time, and if you read through Judges 9, you'll see it there all over the place. What happens every time is there's not just damage, but there's lots of collateral damage. And people who didn't even have a dog in the fight, and somehow they're the ones that are suffering the most. And we realize that in our culture, you know, we can't even go a week without hearing a story somewhere about somebody that's, that's killed their spouse or killed their brother or done a murder-suicide or some kind of domestic violence or assault. And we realize that this was one story in the Bible that's multiplied a zillion times over. There's way more than 70 people a day in this country who are slain on the stone of selfish ambition, greed, lust, or whatever else you want to call it. And as tragic as this is, one of the tragedies is that the story continues. As people choose to be reigned and ruled by their own selfish desires to the point where it doesn't matter what anything else happens as a result, we will get what we want no matter what it costs. Jotham escaped and he ran as far and as fast as adrenaline and terror would take him, with those mind, his mind flashing through those memories and this haunting sounds of his brother's screams. And at some point, he, he gets word from somebody that, um, that Shechem has made Abimelech the king, their king, their ruler. And so Jotham, in Judges chapter 9, goes to a high point where the people of Shechem can all hear what he has to say. And this is where we pick up the story in Judges 9, beginning with verse 7. If you have it, you can go ahead and stand. If not, it'll be on the screen for you, but I would invite you to stand in honor of the reading of the word. When it was told to Jotham, he went up and stood on top of Mount Gerizim and cried aloud and said to them, Listen to me, you lords of Shechem, so that God may listen to you. 
The trees once went out. He tells a fable. It's the oldest one in scripture. The trees once went out to anoint a king over themselves. So they said to the olive tree, reign over us. And the olive tree answered them, shall I stop producing my rich oil by which gods and mortals are honored and go to sway over the trees? So then the trees said to the fig trees, you come and reign over us. But the fig tree answered them, shall I stop producing my sweetness and my delicious fruit and go to sway over the trees? Then the tree said to the vine, you come reign over us. But the vine said to them, shall I stop producing my wine that cheers gods and mortals and go to sway over the trees? So all the trees said to the bramble, or maybe in your translation it says the briar, you come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, if in good faith you're anointing me king over you, then come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. And then he says to the people of Shechem now, therefore, if you acted in good faith and honor when you made Abimelech your king, and if you have dealt well with Jeroboam that's Gideon and his house and have done to him as his actions deserved, which, by the way, don't forget, for my father fought for you and risked his life and rescued you from the hand of Midian. But you have risen up against my father's house this day and have killed his son, 70 men, in one, on one stone, and have made Abimelech the son of his slave woman, king over the lords of Shechem, because he's your kinsman. If... I say, you have acted in good faith and honor with Jeroboam and with his house this day. Then rejoice in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out of Abimelech and devour the lords of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come out of the lords of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. This is the word of the Lord. So you see what's happening here. Jotham gets up on the mountain. He tells this fable, this parable about uh, them starting high, aiming high. We want this, this to be our leader. And, well, they don't want to. This to be no, until they end up with the worst possible choice for who will reign over them. And they've done it willingly, volitionally, even though that's not the kind of thing that Gideon would have been pleased with. They, they've ignored all of that. And at the end of the day, what Jotham says is, it's this line. Have any, have any of you seen Wicked? Phenomenal musical. Got to see it Friday night in Kansas City. There's this line that gets repeated throughout uh, the first act of that over and over and over again. You deserve each other. That is Jotham's message to Shechem and to Abimelech. Y'all deserve each other. If this was done right, you'll celebrate. It'll be wonderful. If it was done wrong, then eventually you will consume each other. And then he ran away, afraid. It says in the next verse, he ran off because he was afraid of his brother. The reign of Abimelech lasted for about three years. So this happened real early on, and it was sometime toward the end of that three years that the folks in Shechem decided, we would like to, we would like to give our loyalty to another leader. And Abimelech, you know, okay, but a man named Gaul rose up and he said, I would be a much leader, better leader than Abimelech. Why don't you guys support me? And they said, okay, we'll support you. But knowing what you know about the kind of leader Abimelech was, what do you think his response to that was? Talk to me. What did he tend to do with his enemies? Eliminate them. So somebody that was in the city heard what their plan was to raise up Gaul, and he said, well, I'm going to go tell Abimelech what's going on. So he went and told Abimelech, and he shows up with his band of murderous men, and the folks from Shechem are out just working in the fields one day, and he starts mowing them down one after the other. And the word gets back to the people in town. He's coming after us, and he's killing everybody. So they all run into a tower. That is their refuge. And it must have been a big one because the scripture says it was big enough to, to fit a thousand people in it. And so they're looking at the tower and Abimelech's looking around and finally he's like, I got an idea. And he says to his men, you watch what I do and all of you do the same thing. And he goes and he starts gathering sticks. And he brings it over and puts it at the bottom of the tower and he gathers them from somewhere else. And he does that and this whole band of men are doing that. They literally put this wood, firewood, all the way around the outside of that tower and then they light it up. And the very same people who said to Abimelech, we want you to be our king, 
Well, you heard the fable. It comes true. It becomes a prophetic word as they are burned to death in their own city at the hand of the one they said, we want you to be our king. It's a strange story, isn't it? It's not over yet. But do you notice anything weird about the sermon today up to this point? Who have we not made, really made mention of today? God. As far as Abimelech was concerned, leave God out of the picture. He wasn't paying any attention at all to what was going on up here. All he was paying attention to was what he wanted. And as far as he was concerned, leave God out of the story altogether. But the narrator refuses to do that. So in chapter 9, verse 23, whoever it was that wrote Judges inserts these words. Chapter 9, verse 23. But God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the lords of Shechem, and the lords of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. Why the division? Why the dissension? Because God said, I know how to frustrate the plans of the wicked, and here's how I'm going to do it here. Which is different than any other story in Judges, because the rest of them, God's people get in trouble, they cry out, he sends a deliverer, they're raised up, it's a judge, they become a warrior. In Deborah's case, um, the, the warrior accompanies her, and they defeat the enemy, and everything goes good for a while, and then the cycle just, you know, continues. In this case, God does not raise up a deliverer to bring about his purposes. He frustrates the plans of the wicked and causes them to have dissension amongst themselves. And we are reminded today, as we see all the way through the story of Judges, that God vehemently and sometimes violently stands up to those who would oppress and deny the kind of life he desires his people to have. And in this case, he does it by dissension among the people. So at this stage in the game, it looks like Abimelech is going to get off scot-free. He's destroyed Shechem, which means he's taken all of their stuff, and now it's his and his band of followers. But once he's had a taste of that power, he's hungry for more of it. And that's the nature of sin, isn't it? We get a little bit of taste of it, and it becomes insatiable, this appetite that we cannot satisfy it. This one who's ruled and reigned by his own selfish ambition is now consumed with more. And so he moves to the next city called Thebes. And they, they just waltz right in and start taking stuff over because this is an unsuspecting place. They're not ready for that at all. And what do the people do whenever that happens? They run to the tower because that's a place of protection. And Abimelech and his men gather outside that tower. And I can see even now the sinister look on this scoundrel's face as he said, we know what to do with this, boys. And they gather sticks. And they gather sticks and they start gathering. And he's looking down and he's looking around this way. But Abimelech fails to look up. And that's the way he's lived his whole life. Who cares about anything going on beyond me, above me, any authority greater than me because he's all himself as the end all of all things. And so he's not paying attention. He's gathering sticks. They're getting ready to light it up. And then all of a sudden, boom, this rock. This millstone comes from on top of the tower at the hand of an unnamed woman, hits him right in the head, and brings him to his death. And the irony is not lost on us that this one who had his brother slain on a stone is now killed by a stone that drops on him. It's a crazy story, isn't it? It's a story full of twists and turns and you think it's going this way and then it goes that way and is the bad guy ever going to get it? And what about those poor people of Shechem who really should have never been surprised at what happened? Why? Because Jotham told him. Why? Because, because this kind of thing has been repeated a zillion times over. And I don't know where I first heard the phrase, but I've owned it as my own. Don't be surprised when the people who do it with you end up being the people who do it to you. seen to play out lots. A couple different scenarios. So we got a man here. He's married. And there's a woman here who's not married to him. 
But he sees her, and she sees him, and they make this connection, and she knows he has a wedding ring on, but that doesn't stop her because it feels so right. And you always got to be, you always got to be on guard whenever it feels right, but it's really wrong. So they engage in this conversation that leads to a relationship and, and uh, it gets sexual and it gets intimate and, and he's still over there being married and, and she's there available whenever he wants to get together. And finally he gets to the point where she's more fun than she is and he's like, I'm going to divorce, divorce her and I'm going to marry her. And the one over here is like, yippee skippy, he wants me, I'm the one, he's going to leave everything for me, it's going to be wonderful, we're going to have this future, white picket fence, it's happily ever after, he picked me. And two or three years later, he's with her, and he sees another one over here. And here she is, dumbfounded. Why on earth would that happen? How could that be? Oh, my goodness, can you believe? Why would he do that to me? I've ne I never saw it coming. Are you kidding me? Don't be surprised. When the one who's willing to do it with you ends up being the one who does it to you. So you're, um, you get a phone call or, or you pass a friend and they're like, Psst, come over here, come here. Psst. I'm not going to tell everybody about this, but I'm telling you because I can trust you. And you're my friend. And did you hear about so-and-so and such-and-such? And, -such? and they proceed to shred that person's reputation like they've got a Ginsu knife working on that thing. And you're just taking it all in. Oh, they trust me. They, will, I mean, they wouldn't just tell anybody about this. Wow, can you believe that? And a couple months later, somebody comes up to you and says, hey, so-and-so, and it's that friend that you know that always has a scoop on everybody. You wouldn't believe what they're saying about you. And all of a sudden, now you're the one who's being sliced and diced in your reputation. And you'd be like, man, how did that happen? I thought, don't be surprised when the person who does it with you becomes the one who does it to you. That's what's happening here. Abimelech, be our king. We're with you, buddy. Here, take our money. We'll get it. We'll support your cause. We'll, we've got your back. And then all of a sudden, this one who is reigned and ruled with a desire for leadership that doesn't go beyond anything more than his own selfish ambition says, now you're in my way. You're not going to support me? Light him up. And eventually, he meets a stone. That instead of being the source upon which he crushes others, it is the stone that crushes him. And it can be a little bit difficult to really find any good news in a gruesome story like this, but, I can, but it's there. It's good news that in spite of how circumstances may look, in spite of how silent may God, God may seem to be, God knows how to frustrate the plans of the wicked. And oftentimes when he doesn't raise up a deliverer in the right here and now, there's some stuff going on that we don't see and the plans of the wicked are being frustrated because God will vehemently and sometimes violently get in the grill of people who want to rob, steal, and destroy the kind of life he gave, he came to give us. You know what else is good news? It's good news that even though the people of Shechem died, and they did. It was a horrible death. Before they died, they got to the point where they were willing to say, just because you were our king yesterday doesn't mean you've got to be our king today. And there are some of us today in church, in worship, who, who are not living with God as our covenant partner. And we've allowed something else to be king, to be ruler. It may be ourselves, our own ambitions. It may, be, it may be that we yesterday, last night, bowed down to the king of alcohol. And today it's saying, you're mine, you're mine. And the good news is that because God has given us the gift of today, which not everybody's gotten. Today is the opportunity for some of us to say, just because it was my king yesterday doesn't mean it's got to be my king today. Not alcohol, not lust, not greed, not selfish ambition, 
Because if we've learned anything at all about human beings in the last however many years we've been around, is that one thing that we're really good at doing is picking the wrong king. And today, Jesus comes to us. He says, no matter what your king was yesterday, I'll be your king today. It's good news, Grace Church, that when it's all said and done, there is only one king that will last forever. Every other king, every other thing that sets itself up, every other thing and every other king that's ever tried to take the place of God in the life of any human being, at some point in time, they're going to be, they're going to be destroyed. And ultimately, even if it is eventually, there will be but one king at which every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The good news for us today is you don't have to wait till that day for him to become your king. It can be now. You know what else is good news? That if Abimelech is still alive in you, and the one that you most identify with in this story is not the brothers who were slain or the one that got away, but you look at your own life story and there's been nobody that's caused more pain to other people in your life than you. There's forgiveness for that too. God's grace is so big, so massive, so mighty, so unbelievable that even the Abimelechs of the world are not beyond redemption if we get to the place where we repent and we call upon God. It was one of the most gruesome scenes in the history of humanity. Some of the most haunting cries ever heard. Some of the sounds that echo and, and, and reverberate even to this day. The sound of nails hitting hammer, hammer hitting nails. The sounds of anguish as a savior cries out, as he pleads on behalf of the father and hangs in abandonment. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the scene is not a stone where the blood of brothers ran like a river. The scene is a cross where the blood of the Savior dripped down a cross. And the contrast could not be greater between Abimelech who was willing to see that his brothers were killed so that he could get what he wanted. And King Jesus, who was willing to be killed himself so that all of his brothers and sisters could get what we most desperately needed. Grace, forgiveness. One more opportunity to say that the king of yesterday will not be my king of today. When Jesus was crucified on that cross of Calvary, his body was not taken, the, his life was not taken from him. It wasn't taken. It was given. It was given for you, and it was given for me. And the blood that dripped down that cross until it formed a pool on the ground was not taken from him. It was offered for us as the only thing in the world that had the power to atone for our sins and to give us new life. And today, we celebrate the reality that King Jesus is among us. And for all of us, no matter, no matter how many bad decisions we made, no matter who we started the day with as our king, he gives us an opportunity to change allegiances today. It's an invitation. It's grace. And it comes to us all. Would you bow your head with me? Lord, I thank you so much for your presence in this place.